The title of our teaching is Satan, Please Come In. And this is part two. And obviously we don't want him to come in. So what we're looking at in this teaching are the things that do kind of welcome him in. And if there's anything that we're doing that welcomes the devil into our lives, we obviously want to immediately address that and get rid of it. Because we don't want to do anything that's going to invite him in. Amen? So, last time um, we said, you know, we're going to look at five categories of things that draw the devil to us. Okay, so we talked about two of these last time. Um, not being born again, obviously you're literally and legally, you're under the dominion of the devil when you're not born again. You are in the kingdom of darkness. He's your God, whether you know it or not, when you're not born again. You are under the devil's rule and reign legally because you have sin. But when you accept Jesus and your sins are washed away, then you're translated out of the kingdom of darkness and you're brought into the kingdom of God, into Christ. Okay, so that's the first thing. Okay, then, then there can be sowing to Satan. So we talked about that last time. Sowing to Satan, especially in the form of habitual sin. You know, if you're habitually sinning, there's a law called sowing and reaping. If you sow to the devil, you're going to reap from the devil. If you sow to God, you're going to reap from God. If you sow evil things, you're going to reap evil things. If you sow good things, you're going to reap good things. Okay, so habitual sin is a major problem. That will most definitely, absolutely draw the devil into your life. Okay, then there are things like envy and strife. You know, these can maybe are a little bit less obvious than like standard sin where you're doing something specifically you shouldn't do, you know, adultery or whatever. But, you know, we can get pulled into strife pretty easily, especially if you're in a household of a mixed bag of faith. You know, everybody in the house could say they're a Christian. Some people want to live by faith and other people want to live by worldly wisdom. And that leads to conflict, which can escalate to strife, which is an invitation for the devil, right? Then sometimes you have personalities of people where somebody in the household thinks it's their right to lord over everybody else in the household or even outside the household. And we're not called to lord it over anyone, so we shouldn't be doing that. That, that is sin, okay? Walking in unforgiveness, um, that's a major sin. You know, and then if, if any of these kind of sinful things are going on in our lives, then we're likely to have a guilty conscience. And if you have a guilty conscience, your faith is hindered. If your faith is hindered, then you're vulnerable to the devil wreaking havoc. Okay, so we talked about that at length last time. So what I want to start on today is faith vulnerabilities. And we'll talk about three categories of this. We'll probably only do one of those today, which is uh, fear. You know, so faith in the devil is the number one faith vulnerability. Faith in the devil is called fear. And if we would start calling it faith in the devil instead of fear, then it would be very motivating to get out of fear quickly rather than embracing and accepting fear. We absolutely need to fight against fear. The other things we'll talk about will be um, you're vulnerable if you don't have a shield of faith. And you're vulnerable if you do not resist the devil or you don't know how to resist him then he can just run you over. It doesn't matter how much of the word of God you know and believe. If you don't resist him, then you're a guinea pig. You know, he can just do what he wants. Okay, then we'll talk in some upcoming sessions about speaking death and then sharing revelation. So, so you know, doing the will of God can also draw the devil to, because he wants to try and stop you. Okay, so let's talk about faith vulnerability number one, which is faith in the devil also known as fear. The Bible positions fear and faith as opposites. We have the Holy Spirit of God who is juxtaposed with the devil's spirit of fear. Fear is literally faith in the devil to receive evil things in life. It is an expectation of negative outcomes, whereas good faith is faith in God, whereby we expect to receive good things from him. Okay, so when people are in fear, probably unbeknownst to them, they're actually placing their faith, they're placing their confidence, they're placing their expectation in the devil to receive bad things. I mean, that's what fear is. You know, fear is, fear is a, a worry, a concern, an expectation that bad things are going to happen. That is faith. Okay, and so we don't want faith in the devil anywhere in our lives. 
Okay, so we can see this juxtaposition in 2 Timothy 1, 6-7. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Okay, so the gift that was given by the laying on of hands, that's the Holy Spirit. So he's referring to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so Paul is talking to, to Timothy, and um, he's talking about the Holy Spirit, the gift of God, which is in him from the laying on of hands, the Holy Spirit. For God has not given us a spirit of fear. Okay, so that means the, the spirit of fear is not from God. The spirit of fear only has one other choice of where it's from. It's from the devil. Okay, so the spirit of fear is from the devil. In contrast, God has given us the Holy Spirit, which you know is a spirit of miraculous power, a spirit of love, and a spirit of sound mind. Okay, so spirit of fear is not from God. By default, it's from the devil. Okay? So, in Matthew um, chapter 8, verse 24 to 26, And suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea, so that the boat was covered with waves, but he, Jesus, was asleep. Then his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. But he said to them, Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? Then Jesus arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. Okay, so here again we can see, um, we can see that if you're in fear, then you are of little faith, specifically of little faith in God. When you are in fear, you are literally trusting in the devil to bring steal, kill, destroy, death, destruction, sickness, disease, calamity, problems, failure, etc. into your life. And so the condition they were in, they were perishing because of the storm. They were going to be drowned um, out there in the middle of the, the sea. And, and they were fearful. Okay, And so Jesus is likening fear to being of little faith. Okay, Little faith in God. Okay, so we can see that you know fear is like the antithesis of of faith in God. It's it's a contradiction to faith in God. So you're either you're in fear, you're trusting in the devil for a bad outcome, or you're in faith, you're trusting in God for a good outcome, but you are not simultaneously in faith and in fear. You are in one or the other. You are trusting in God or you're trusting in the devil. You're expecting a good thing or you're expecting a bad thing. And so we have to eradicate fear because you know, whatever you have faith in and you speak forth and you align your actions with, you're going to receive that, whether it's a good thing or whether it's a bad thing. Okay, and we can look at a great example here in Luke chapter 8 where Jesus is trying to, uh, he's trying to regulate the atmosphere of fear. He's trying to, he's doing some things to get fear removed from the situation. So in verses 49 to 55, while Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying to him, Your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him, saying, Do not be afraid. Only believe, and she will be made well. When Jesus came into the house, he permitted no one to go in except Peter, James, and John, and the father and mother of the girl. Now all wept and mourned for her, but Jesus said, Do not weep, she is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him, knowing that she was dead. But he put them all outside, took her by the hand, and called, saying, Little girl, arise. Then her spirit returned, and she arose immediately. And he commanded that she be given something to eat. Okay, so first of all, um, you know, these people came and they said, your daughter is dead. And the first thing out of Jesus's mouth is do not be afraid, only believe. So you can see, do not be afraid is in one hand, believing is in the other hand. So they are opposites. Either you're in fear or you are in faith. If you're in faith, you're believing and expecting good things from God. If you are afraid, you are trusting in the devil and expecting to receive evil things from him. So if you enter into fear, failure is almost guaranteed. Okay? So we, especially like when we're in a crisis situation 
it's almost like you want to try and turn off your emotions. You know, so like when my mom almost died a couple weeks ago, um, I was relatively emotionless. You know, I just try and shut off emotions because if you allow your emotions to do what they want to do, you're going to end up worrying. You're going to end up with anxiety. You're going to start crying. You're going to be uh, a fearing death and whatever else. And if you do that, you're just going to spiral down into failure. Okay. So I'm not saying that we'd be cold hearted, but the best way for us to express our love for someone that's that's around us rather than entering into fear rather than getting emotional the best thing we can do is to control our emotions remain in a place of faith and then by our faith deliver help to them amen that's what we have to do okay so jesus that's the first thing out of his mouth do not be afraid if you believe she will be made well Okay, so if we want them to be made well, if we want them to live, if we want the victory, we absolutely have to eradicate fear and we have to absolutely believe and then we get the victory. So what does Jesus do to help this situation? Okay, so first of all, he wouldn't let everybody come in. He didn't want to put on a show. He only permitted people who'd already been working miracles with him, Peter, James, and John. These guys had already been out. They'd already been working um, miracles. They've already seen Jesus do who knows how many hundreds or thousands of, of healings and miracles. So these guys, um, by way of testimony, by way of witnessing, and, and by way of doing, these people were in faith. Amen? Okay, then he also, he made us... A, a statement do not weep she is not dead but sleeping so what he's trying to do is he's trying to redirect people from the word death because when we think of the word death then we think it's a permanent unfixable unresolvable situation and it's it's the game is over it's time to quit she's dead it, game's over right and jesus is trying to kind of take away that permanency that that thought of permanency of death and he's proclaiming that she's sleeping. Okay, well, is, is he lying? No, he's not lying because he's he's declaring the outcome, right? I mean, he's declaring that she went through a, a phase of sleep and now she's about to wake up. Okay, so you could say um, maybe his perspective was that he considers death to be sleep. But in the end, what he's trying to do is he's trying to get people away from this permanent concept of death, redirect them to thinking of her as sleeping. It's temporary. She's going to wake up. And then they laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. Okay, so here, here's where you're going to have a struggle in your family and friends and whatever. Is there are people that are absolutely fact-minded and they're not spiritual-minded. Okay, so I have family members like this. And, and so, Bobby, the fact is, you know, X, Y, and Z, um, the doctor says she, she has this, she has that, and she has this. These are permanent conditions. These are incurable conditions. That's the, those are the facts. I'm like, forget your facts. I don't want to hear your facts. The fact is, the truth is, by the stripes of Jesus, her healing is paid for. I don't care what man says. I don't care if the doctor says it's a permanent condition. I reject that. No, but Bobby, the facts are. So forget the facts. If you are fact-minded, then you are failure-minded. Okay, because facts change. The fact is yesterday they were well. The fact is today they are sick. And the fact is, if you keep thinking in facts, they're going to be dead. <laughs> you know, you have to think beyond the facts. You have to think spiritually minded. You have to set your mind on spiritual truths. And if you set your mind on spiritual truth, like by the stripes of Jesus, the healing is paid for, then the facts will rearrange to that truth that you're believing in. But if you're stuck over here, stuck on the facts, you're not going to receive the good news. Okay, so these people were fact minded, knowing that she was dead. They couldn't get beyond that. So what did Jesus do with them? He didn't, he didn't want those people that were ridiculing him, that were trying to negate his faith, that were trying to negate the faith of those who are with him, who he needs to believe. He kicked them out. He put them all outside. So all these people that are fact minded knowing that she was dead, all these people that are ridiculing him, they're anti-faith people, because they're ridiculing him, he kicked them out. He put them all outside. Amen? So he's trying to separate from him and his disciples the, the people that are producing fear, the people that are 
agreeing with the work of the devil that she's dead, it's permanent, the game is over. He's separating himself from them. So he's trying to create an atmosphere more conducive to faith and less conducive to fear. And then he simply grabbed the girl by the hand, little girl, arise. Okay, so that's a command. A little girl, arise, that's a command. A majority of what Jesus did was an exercising of authority by way of a word of a command. And boom, her spirit returned and she arose immediately. Amen? And, and so this tells us a lot of what we need to do in our own life situations. Okay? So what are our remedies for fear? What are our remedies to exit from faith in the devil? Okay, so first of all, we need um, Bible study from teachers that bear fruit in the particular areas that we need help in. If we're worried about our health, then and you know then you would want to learn from like a curry blake and andrew womack a barry bennett you know even our teaching you know anyone who has fruit in the area of health and healing you want to go take bible study from them you want to devour testimonies i think if the body of christ would start devouring testimonies you would see more and more and more miracles there's plenty of good teaching available but we need to strengthen what we've heard from the word, we need to strengthen it with just abundance of testimonies. See, the disciples had a supreme advantage over us. They weren't even born again. They did not have a permanent baptism of the Holy Spirit, and they only had delegated authority, yet they were healing like amazingly. They were extremely prosperous in miracle ministry, even though they were unborn again. Why is that? Because for three years, they got to witness Jesus just constantly healing, dead raising, bringing forth supernatural provision, uh, escaping all the attacks of the enemy. You know, they got to witness all this miraculous stuff live and in person for three years. And so they had perfect testimonies. They were able to firsthand witness all these amazing things. Well, um, what we can do is we can read stories, we can watch videos, we can share with one another, and it will work on us in an extremely positive way as well. Okay, it would be better to watch it live and in person, but nonetheless, we can devour testimonies and that will absolutely strengthen our faith. The other thing is we need to get personal faith victories. And our natural tendency as humans is we tend to replay failures over and over. Oh, I should have done this. I should have done that. I guess I wasn't believing, blah, blah, blah. And so we're like replaying our failures over and over. And then what does that do? It just makes you more failure minded. So instead of replaying all those failure stories, we need to replay all these personal victories. Replay your faith victories, and then you'll be strengthened in faith. Okay, then secondly, we should meditate upon scriptures. You know, um, when we're worrying, what are we doing? We're meditating upon a bad thing. When you're worrying, you're meditating upon all variety of potential negative outcomes that could happen. Well, what we want to do is we want to flip the script and we want to meditate on scriptures. You know, and believers will go into all the world and in his name we will cast out demons. We will lay hands upon the sick and they will recover. So what you want to do is just imagine yourself. Just close your eyes and daydream about, you know, you drive up on a car crash on the freeway and you jump out of your car and you lay hands on the injured person and boom, they're healed. Um, you daydream about going in the hospital and you pray for somebody, you lay hands upon the sick and boom, they are healed. You know, you want to imagine all these different scenarios. You know, that's a form of meditating upon scriptures. You want to daydream about it. You want to envision yourself doing that good thing that the scripture says you're, you are anointed to do. Amen. So you want to do that. You want to, um, you want to meditate on testimonies. You want to meditate on your personal victories. You want to meditate on positive things in general. We have to steer our thoughts away from negative and failure-minded thoughts. And we have to focus our thoughts on positive things like scriptures, testimonies, personal victories, and any other thing positive. But we have to keep our mind from meditating upon negative outcomes. Okay, the third thing we should do is, you know, scripture confession I think this is absolutely huge. I think it's one of the most important things we can do. Um, just take promises of God, read them aloud, um, put your name in it multiple times, and Bobby shall go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And Bobby shall lead many 
thousands to salvation and Bobby shall cast out demons in the name of Jesus and Bobby shall speak in tongues and Bobby shall um, be immune to serpents and poison and Bobby shall lay hands upon the sick and they will recover you know so if you put your name in the scripture then it's as if God is speaking directly to you and you hear it that way Okay, then you want to make it first person, whereas you've taken ownership of the scripture. I declare in the name of Jesus that I go into all the world and I preach the gospel to every creature. Countless thousands hear the word that I preach and they believe and they are baptized and they are saved. And I declare in the name of Jesus, I believe in Jesus. Therefore, I work the works of Jesus. I cast out devils in the name of Jesus. I speak in tongues and I'm edified in faith. I um, am immune to serpents and poison and any deadly and hurtful and harmful thing. I am preserved by God and I declare in the name of Jesus. I believe in Jesus and I lay my hands upon the sick and they will, they shall, and they do recover. Right? So I've just taken Mark 16 and I made it first person and I confessed it. Okay? And then you want to thank God for it. Father, I thank you. Thank you that you have made me a preacher. Thank you that you have commissioned me to preach and teach. Thank you that at your words, which I speak, great faith will arise and people will be saved and they will be baptized. Thank you for establishing me as a believer. Thank you for giving me authority over the devil such that at my word of command, in the name of Jesus, devils are cast out. Thank you for giving me the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for giving me the ability to pray in tongues and be edified in power and in faith. Thank you that you have put your preservation protection upon me and serpents and poison and any other deadly or hurtful things shall not harm me. And thank you that I believe in Jesus. And therefore, when I lay my hands upon the sick, thank you that you do deliver them. You do heal them and you do save them. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Amen. So when you do that on a daily basis with you know a variety of scriptures, these things are going to come alive and well in your life. And you can't continue in fear. Like if you're declaring how you're protected by God and nothing shall by any means harm you, if you're declaring that no evil shall befall you, if you are declaring that no plague shall come near your dwelling, if you are declaring that his angels are in charge of you and they protect you in all of your ways, then you're, if you're doing that, you're not going to have fear because you are, you're contradicting fear. You're proclaiming faith and you're strengthening those beliefs inside of yourself. And you're also going to receive according to your confession and you are confessing good things. You are confessing scripture and you will receive accordingly. Amen. Okay. Now, uh, now this next one is also, it's very important. What are you feeding on? Because faith and fear come the same way. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God, hearing testimonies of God. Well, how does fear come? Fear is faith in the devil. So fear comes by way of hearing also. If you're listening to the doctor tell you, you know, they're going to die. It's incurable. There's no treatment. You know, they have a month to live. You know, if you, if you listen to that, you know, fear comes by hearing. Fear also comes by what are you researching on the internet? Are you... You know, you have a loved one who's in a perilous situation. Are you researching, you know, stage four cancer and, and studying everything you can find about stage four cancer? Or are you studying, are you going online and you're reading about the stripes of Jesus and you're watching testimonies? What are you feeding on? If you are feeding on the negative side of the equation, you're going to strengthen your expectation of receiving the negative thing and you will receive it. If you're if you're feeding on faith related things, you're going to strengthen your faith in God and you're going to increase, um, you're going to increase the opportunity of that good thing to happen. Amen. So are you consuming words of God or words of the devil? Are you consuming testimonies of God or testimonies of the devil? Are you consuming worldly wisdom such as medicine, um, you know, medicine, science, you know, fact-oriented things, worldly wisdom, or are you consuming godly wisdom? Are you studying about the stripes of Jesus and testimonies and things like that? So whatever you're feeding on is going to establish whether you are in fear or whether you are in faith. This is huge. Because a lot of people, you know, unfortunately we have family members or friends that they are very science-oriented and they talk about every, they're just devouring what they studied on the web and how bleak it is and they don't have faith and so they can't hope for something good and so they're just 
they're speaking all this negative stuff. So in addition to you personally not pursuing worldly wisdom, you, you need to cut out some people from your life also and or you know or shut them down if they start speaking anti-faith stuff right you cannot feed on failure because you will receive it okay the other thing we saw is um especially we can see this in the story of peter you know are you focusing on the problem or are you focusing on the solution focusing on the problem makes it an insurmountable giant and god it makes him a grasshopper Okay, you know, just like the children of Israel, they kept, you know, they, they sent spies into the promised land. There were 12 spies. Two of them came back and said, oh, we can surely take them. You know, even, even though they saw the giants, we can surely take this land because God has given us a promise and we can take this land. The other 10 were proclaiming, oh, but they're giants. We're like little grasshoppers in their sight. And they just kept talking about how big the problem was. Well, those spies went on to die and all the children of Israel suffered for 40 years because of those 10 spies that brought back an evil report. And what was evil about their report is they disbelieved what God had said and they believed only what their eyes saw. And it was an, an and they made, you know, the physical giants an insurmountable, insurmountable obstacle and they minimized the promise of God, and they did not receive the promise of God. They all died and were miserable for 40 years. Okay, and you can look at Peter, and we're going to look at that in a minute. You know, when Peter started to walk on the water, he had his eyes on Jesus. Lord, tell me to come and I'll come. And Jesus told him to come, and Peter's walking on the water in the middle of a storm. And then he focused on the wind and the waves, and boom, 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 boom. you know, he starts blowing bubbles and sinking because when you shift your attention from God to the problem, then that fear can take over and then failure takes over. Okay? So we have to keep our eyes fixated on God and his solution. Okay? Then the next one, what's going on with our words and actions? Are our words and actions aligned with faith in God or faith in the devil? Are our words, words of faith in God are our words speaking forth of fears? We need to be speaking faith and not speaking fears. What are our actions aligned with? Are, are, are our actions faith, faith aligned actions or are our actions fear aligned actions? Because your actions proclaim your faith. Your words proclaim your faith and your actions proclaim your faith. So I could say, oh yeah, I'm trusting in God for protection. And then when some loud noise happens in the backyard and I grab my gun and I go out in the backyard because, you know, this is what you do. You have to have a gun to protect yourself. Then I've negated my faith. You know, either I believe that God is the source of my protection and I just go outside, shorts and t-shirt, no, no gun, or, uh, or I like take, you know, a gun and my actions my actions have proclaimed my faith that i'm not trusting in god i'm trusting in myself with this weapon to protect myself so my actions would be disagreeing with my words if i went outside with the gun yet i was proclaiming that i'm trusting in god for protection amen so sometimes our mouth is saying the right thing but our actions are saying something opposite so we need both our words and our actions aligned with faith and then that's going to assure our victory. So do both your words and your actions agree with your position of faith. Sometimes we say the right things, but our actions contradict and nullify our faith in God. Thus bears its evil fruit. Thus fear bears its evil fruit. And we don't want that to happen. Okay, then the last one is, you know, we're talking about remedies to fear is to try and regulate your environment as much as you can. You know, just like Jesus regulated the environment in this passage in Luke, he was putting the naysayers outside, the, the ones who were ridiculing, he put them outside. The ones that were fact-minded, he put them outside. He limited who he involved in the situation to uh, a couple of people that he knew were in faith because they had been with him, right? So he was regulating the environment. Well, we want to regulate our environment when we're in a situation as much as we can. And, and, and we, we'll probably never get it perfect, right? You're not going to separate yourself from 
every possible source of negativity, but the more negativity we can separate from us, then the better that will be. Amen? Okay, so let's talk about a couple of more fear failure passages. We're going to look at Peter sinking. We'll um, look at Job's fear. And actually, I, I don't have this last one prepared. Um, so you know, we anecdotally talked about it already. So we'll skip that one. Okay, so focusing on circumstances leads to fear and doubt. And that, of course, leads to failure. So in, in Matthew chapter 14. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So Jesus said, Come. And Peter and when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshiped Jesus, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Okay, so first of all, what gave Peter the confidence, the faith, to walk on water in the first place? Okay, so the first thing that happened is he saw Jesus doing it. So he had a live testimony in front of his face. You know, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. So he's witnessing, he's already witnessing this miracle of walking on the sea. Okay, so he had testimony. And then secondly, um, Peter had a word from God to do something. Okay, he said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And so Jesus said, come. Okay, so he had a word of God. He had a promise of God. He had a command from God. And so when, you know, hearing the, you know, faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God, right? Okay, so he had a word from God. So his faith was established from the word of God, his faith was established from witnessing Jesus himself walking on the sea. Okay, so in the same way, what's going to increase our faith? You know, if we see something being done, you know, either live and in person, or by way of testimony stories, or testimony videos, or anything like that, you know, if we can see things being done that we're trying to believe in, then that's going to establish our faith. If we can read things being done. It's going to establish our faith. If we talk to one another about miraculous things being done, it's going to strengthen our faith. Okay, then we also need words from God. And words of God are, you know, the Bible's filled with them. Our teaching is filled with them. So we have to know and believe God's goodwill. Um, words from God could also be specific prophecies, not limited to things in the Bible, but specific prophecies that have been given to us you know, by God through a person uh, or to us directly. So those things would be words from God also, right? And so that's the foundational thing, testimonies and a word of God. Okay, then what caused Peter to exit from faith and begin to sink? Well, the problem was, is that he shifted his focus. He shifted his focus from Jesus onto the troublesome circumstances. He stopped focusing on Jesus and immediately he started to sink. Okay, so he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. Okay, so he was in faith when his eyes were upon Jesus, when he was thinking about Jesus walking on the sea, when he was thinking about the command from God, he had faith. And as he had faith, he was walking on the water. Okay, but then he shifted his attention from Jesus to the water to the wind. He saw the wind was boisterous and he became afraid. 
Okay, so focusing on the circumstance will produce fear. And what happened when this fear arose? He began to sink. Failure arose. Amen? Well, what happens when, you know, you're like, you know, by the stripes of Jesus, my mom, um, she, she is healed by the stripes of Jesus. Jesus bore her sicknesses. He carried her pains. I declare in the name of Jesus that she, um, she's healed. She's, yeah, the healing power of God is working in her body. Victory is ours. Okay? As long as we have that mindset, things are good, and we're going to receive what we're believing in. But if for some reason we were to deviate from that, like maybe like five doctors in a row come in and try and talk us into some other negative outcome, then that would be that would be like looking at the wind and the waves, you know, and it could produce fear and it could bring forth failure. So you can't focus on you can't focus on negative things, you can't focus on the problem, you can't focus on the anti-faith words and thoughts that inevitably will come towards you. If you do, it leads to failure. Okay? So we don't want to do that. Okay, so what is the implication of Peter's situation uh, upon us? So first of all, we need to stay focused on the promises of God. We need to keep them fresh in our minds and hearts with um, prayer and confession. Okay, secondly, we need to avoid indulging in the problem by daydreaming about the problem, by worrying about the problem. Don't go and study the problem. Don't be incessantly talking about the problem. And especially don't share your problems or problems of other people. Don't share them with people who don't operate in faith. The worst thing you can do is tell some unbeliever or a skeptic you know, or a worldly minded person, if you say, oh, my relative, they're, they're sick, they're in the hospital, they have cancer, the doctor says they're going to die, but we believe that by the stripes of Jesus, they shall be healed. And then you tell this doubting, unbelieving person, uh, and then, uh, oh no, they're going to die, blah, blah, and, you know, they're going to start strengthening the position of failure. And you don't want that. You don't want to tell anybody about your problems that do not operate in faith, because they're going to they're going to pour out their worldly wisdom of death and destruction. They're going to negate your faith. They're going to ask for 10 million updates on what's going on. And try and dr the devil will use them to try and draw out a negative confession. And if the devil can draw out a negative confession from you, then he's going to have victory. He's negated your faith. Okay? So don't tell people that are not known to operate in faith. As much as you can avoid it, don't do it. I mean, sometimes you have to, like, you can't withhold from a family member, hey, um, you know, your relatives, you know, your relatives in the hospital, you, you can't necessarily withhold that from somebody, but you want to try and you know, limit it as much as possible, okay? Okay, then number four, how did Peter salvage the situation? So after entering into fear and beginning to sink, he called out to Jesus for a lesser miracle of rescue from the situation. He got reestablished in faith, sufficient for rescue. Okay, so he was doing this super miraculous thing of walking on water. And then he began to sink. But then he had, um, he had enough faith to say, Lord, save me. Right? So he had sufficient faith for rescue, um, which is good. Right? So the same thing can happen to us. You know, a, a, many situations, many life situations that we apply our faith in, Sometimes they start to go the wrong direction first, but then you can course correct as you're in the situation. Just because you said one wrong thing, you know, don't let that take you down. You know, like it happens to all of us. We can all have fear aligned actions. We may all have moments of fear. We may, we may all speak forth some of our fears. Don't let that trap you that, oh my God, I'm doomed because I spoke this fear. You don't want to keep doing it. But you want to you want to contradict you know if you've spoken some things that are out of alignment with God's will, then you need to cast down your own words. I've casted down my own words countless times, okay, and then just gather yourself back up into a place of faith, just like Peter did. Lord, save me, and he was saved, okay. So we won't handle every situation perfectly, but you can always muster up enough faith. Lord, save me, and and get saved, just like Peter did. Amen. Okay, so according to this passage, we see this relationship. When we focus on the Word of God, and when we focus on testimonies, it leads to faith, and it leads to victory. When we focus on circumstances, 
it leads to fear and doubt, and that leads to failure. And so we always want to remember fear is our enemy. Whatever fear you have, we need to seek to eradicate it with word of God and with testimonies, primarily. Okay, then also fear unknowingly is faith in the devil, and we need to eradicate fear. Fear is faith in the devil. We need to eradicate it. Amen.